You can tell me asking that question? No? Yes? Everybody ready for the final? So somebody just asked me when I'm bringing the note cards. My intention was to bring them today. And in fact, my intention was very good. I laid them on top of my bag to bring over here. And when I grabbed the bag, I set them aside. And then I don't know why I did that. But the upshot of, of it is I don't have the note cards with me. So uh, two things. One, uh, if you really want a note card, you may follow me back to my office after class, and I will give you a note card. And number two, if you want to get one in class on um, Friday, I'll bring it to class on Friday unless I forget, in which case nobody will get a note card. Not, not, a, good, not, not a good option. Yes? Uh, are we going to have a review session? Uh, do you guys want a review session? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I should plan that then, shouldn't I? Um, I will plan one. Um, I'm thinking probably weekend is the best time. Um, so um, if I'm going to do that, I probably would do it on Sunday would be my guess. Sunday, what kind of feeling? Sunday morning, is that what somebody said? Uh, Sunday morning isn't best for me. I, I, I don't go to church, but I like to jog. So, uh, what's that? We'll do it right during the baseball game. Is that right? Okay, I will let you know about that. All right. Now, uh, let me say one more thing about the note cards. I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again. So, the note cards you have to get from me, and you're required to turn a note card in with your exam. And that note card has to have come from me, okay? That means you need to get one from me, period, okay? If you don't turn a note card in with your exam, even if you didn't use it, didn't want one, it's going to cost you points. So you need to get a note card and turn it in with the exam, even if you're not going to use it. Is that clear? TV land, is that clear? Okay. Yes? Do we get graded for turning it in, or do we get graded on its content? You get graded on not turning one in, in which case you get a negative grade. You know. Um, I actually do look at them. I, I find that they're really interesting to see how students organize things, and I think you'll learn something in organizing your note card. Uh, so um, I don't do anything with them in terms of grading them. No, I'm not going to do that. But I do find them interesting to look at in terms of what students put on. Yes? Are you able to type the note card? The answer is absolutely no. Everything on the note card must be in your own handwriting. Okay? Nothing copied. That is, no photocopies, no typing, no printing. It's got to be in your own handwriting, everything on the note card. And no, you can't tape six pages to it either. Okay? I've seen people try that. Yeah. <laughs> people have tried it. But it okay. So, and yes, you can use both sides of the note card. And if you want to write on the edge of the note card, you can do that too. So it's a pretty narrow edge. But yes, question. Can you use colored ink so long as you don't use different colored glasses to do it? And the answer is yes, you can. That helps you to organize things. Yeah. And that's one of the things I find is interesting looking at how people organize things, is that color actually helps also. That's cool. But I won't let you have two different colored glasses or three different colored glasses to um, shuffle with. That, that's, that's not OK. All right. So we are on our final topic, believe it or not. Believe it or not. Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis? No. I, I actually have one more thing to say about photosynthesis, but that'll just take a minute. The final topic is nitrogen metabolism. Shh. Okay. The final topic is nitrogen metabolism. And um, a lot of things are involved in nitrogen metabolism. You can teach entire courses on that. And again, we're going to have two lectures, today and Friday. Okay. The uh, nitrogen metabolism affects things like the urea cycle. It affects things like amino acid metabolism. It affects nucleotide metabolism. And it affects the nitrogen balance in the world. So there's all kinds of things that are really important about nitrogen metabolism. Before I talk about that, is that funny? <laughs> uh, the, uh, before I talk about that, there's one last thing I didn't talk about the other day on photosynthesis, and I want to finish that. It was actually mentioned in the song. So I want to, I want to um, uh, show you that. Uh, and it's interesting. I told you that, that um, Rubisco was a, an enzyme that was not very efficient. Okay. And I didn't really tell, explain that inefficiency to you, but now I'm going to show that inefficiency to you here. Okay? One of the byproducts of Rubisco is that the reason it's inefficient is it can, in addition to doing the, the, the catalysis with carbon dioxide, it can also 
react with oxygen. And the reactions with oxygen are largely unproductive. If it weren't for a certain ability of plants to do things, some of the reactions would actually be toxic. All right? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, look what happens when, uh, here's the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, which is the normal substrate. Normally, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate combines with carbon dioxide to make um, ultimately two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. All right? But if oxygen in instead uh, comes in, what you end up making is 3-phosphoglycerate. There's one of those two 3-phosphoglycerates. But the other molecule you make is um, um, phosphoglycerate, which is not 3-phosphoglycerate, but phosphoglycerate. And phosphoglycerate falls apart to become glycolate, and that falls apart to become glyoxylate. All right? Glyoxylate is actually reasonably poisonous. All right? Now, you may remember when I talked about the glyoxylate cycle that I said that there were two groups of organisms that had the enzymes to handle glyoxylate. One was bacteria, and the other was plants. One of the reasons plants have a glyoxylate cycle is actually to handle the production of glyoxylate, as you see here. Okay? So that glyoxylate cycle turns out to be useful. The glyoxylate that's produced here can be used to make oxaloacetate, which can be used to make glucose. It's not an energy source as such, but at least it can be productively used to make something else, and that productive use uh, to make something else is uh, better than having this uh, compound harm the plant. Okay. So the glyoxylate cycle is important in that respect. Yes, sir? Very good question. Um, it's a question I've wondered about myself. His question was, do C4 plants produce less glyoxylate because they have things more embedded inside of them? My suspicion is they do have less glyoxylate, and that's one of the reasons that they're more efficient. But I'm not a botanist, and I don't know the answer to that question. But it's, it's one I've wondered about as well. I think it's a very good question. OK. So that's the last thing I'll say about photosynthesis, to the sadness of all the botanists in the room. Um, I will now turn attention to nitrogen metabolism. Okay? So nitrogen metabolism, as I said, is uh, very important for a lot of things. Balancing nitrogen in the body is an important consideration. Um, we can, uh, our, our bodies really are dependent on um, other organisms for uh, what we call nitrogen fixation. Okay? We can't take Ni uh, nitrogen out of the atmosphere and use it to make amino acids, for example. It's a no-go. We can't do it. In fact, when we look at the number of organisms that can do this, there are relatively small numbers of organisms that can do this. Okay? They're known as nitrogen fixation organisms. And we find them uh, not exclusively, but certainly frequently in the soil. We find them um, in nodules of leguminous plants. So leguminous plants include things like beans and, th and things like that that have these bacteria that are able to take and um, convert that atmospheric nitrogen into something that's useful uh, for the plant, a reduced form um, of nitrogen. And um, I always like to point to those bacteria as one of the very, very good reasons for us to be thinking about and worried about polluting our environment. Okay. We are totally dependent upon them for our nitrogen, period. When we start killing those organisms that are producing the nitrogen that we need to make amino acids and proteins, we, as a world, will die. Okay? I can't get any more serious than that. That's pretty important to think about. Okay? And as I said, the number of organisms that do that are relatively small. All right? So life on Earth is supported by a variety of things. We think of plants capture sun energy and uh, provide important um, resources for us through photosynthesis. But every bit as important are the nitrifying uh, bacteria, the nitrogen uh, fix fixing bacteria. Well, um, the overall process of uh, the, what the nitrogen in the, um, in the environment is depicted in this uh, slide here. There's a variety of ways, and no, I'm not going to ask you to memorize all these ways in which nitrogen can be fixed. And we say, when we say fixed, we're talking about 
converting it from atmospheric nitrogen into some other usable form. Okay? When we talk about nitrogen fixation, there's, there are a variety of organisms that participate um, in that process. Um, and they're part of what we call the nitrogen cycle. Okay? So there are various cycles that exist out in the world. The nitrogen cycle is one that you see uh, depicted here. All right. Well, specifically what some of these organisms are doing are they're fixing nitrogen by reducing it. Uh, there's, mo there's molecular atmospheric nitrogen on the left, N2, the way it exists. And in order to fully reduce it, when you fully reduce it, you produce ammonium ions, or ammonia, um, uh, same thing, essentially. And those ammonium ions, as you can see, require protons. And more importantly, they require electrons, 16 electrons. Fixation of nitrogen is a very energy demanding process. You can see 16 ATPs as well. And it's requiring a lot of reducing equivalents, NADPH, for example, to be able to produce the, these guys over here. Now, I'm not going to ask you to reproduce this cycle up here because I think that's uh, ridiculous. But I do think that you should know something about the enzyme that actually does this. Okay? So enzymes that do this are called nitrogenases. All right? Nitrogenases. And they typically require a very uh, anaerobic environment, meaning that these reactions don't occur well in an oxygen environment. They require an anaerobic environment. One of the reasons that these things are occurring frequently in the nodules of leguminous plants is that the leguminous plants provide a nice anaerobic environment for the reaction to proceed. You expose the enzyme to oxygen and you can actually ruin the enzyme. Okay. Nitrogen is important because nitrogen um, in some ways is a limiting nutrient. Okay. In some ways. Nitrogen travels through our cells, through our bodies, in some interesting ways. And we follow these ways um, mostly, at least in this class, through amino acids. All right? So the amine group of amino acids, of course, is an NH2. That's a nitrogen. That's a reduced nitrogen. And amino acids, we, we will see in their metabolism, are swapping amine groups. They're passing them from one amino acid to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And so the balance about who gets the, the amine and who passes on the amine is very, very important because cells have to have the proper amount of all of the amino acids that they need to make proteins. All right? So it's very important that we balance this properly. Well, one of the very big players in the nitrogen passing on or the nitrogen... Um, um, uh, what? Storage, if you want to think about it, is the amino acid glutamine. All right? Glutamine plays a central role in this process. Now, you did, I didn't make you memorize the structure of glutamine, all right? but glutamine um, has very important property. It has two amine groups. It has an amine group um, on its carboxyamide R group, and it has an alpha amine group as well. All right. These amine groups can be swapped on and off as necessary for the um, uh, cell to pass these things on. All right. Well, we can see here that um, here is glutamate. The difference between glutamate and glutamine is that glutamate has an oxygen where glutamine, I'm sorry, it has a, has a carboxyl where glutamine has a carboxamide. It's basically replacing a double bonded oxygen with an amine group. Now I'm going to come back to that on a couple of things. I'll show you the reaction in a minute. But replacing a double bonded oxygen with an amine, or vice versa, is called a transamination. Transamination. Replacing a double bonded oxygen with an amine, or vice versa, is a transamination. So, if I take glutamate and I add 
an amine group to it, like I see here, all right, I convert glutamate into glutamine. So the balance going back and forth between glutamate and glutamine is important. Here, glutamine is carrying the um, amine group. If I go from glutamine upwards back to glutamate, then I'm donating that amine group to something else. Okay? So glutamine is like a repository. It's a way of stashing and holding on to amines until you pass it on to something else. And when you pass it on to something else, glutamine becomes glutamate. Glutamate can also pass on its amine to something else. And if it does that, it becomes alpha-ketoglutarate, an intermediate in the citric acid cycle. So the three things here, and I'm, I'm going to repeat it, the three things here that have a very important dynamic relationship are glutamine, which can become glutamate, and glutamate, which can become alpha-ketoglutarate. Those three molecules have a very interesting relationship. They all differ by one amine. Alpha-ketoglutarate has no amines. Glutamate has one amine, and glutamine has two amines. Well, what you see here, glutamine can go and donate amine groups to make any of these molecules here. It can donate amines to make any of these molecules here. But in fact, it's very important for the synthesis of any of those molecules right there. And you'll notice that every molecule right there has at least one amine. It needs to have that in order to um, be the, the molecule that it is. So glutamine plays a very, very important role in the process. Now, you see all kinds of red bars up here, all right? These things up here, all right, will actually inhibit this reaction from occurring, all right? AMP, when it builds up, will inhibit glutamine synthetase. All of these guys will inhibit glutamine synthetase. Why do they inhibit glutamine synthetase? Well, when you've got plenty of these molecules, you presumably also have plenty of glutamine because glutamine was necessary to make those molecules. No, you're not going to reproduce this figure. But you should know that glutamine is playing a very central role in the metabolism of many biological molecules that have amine groups. Very, very important consideration. Because glutamine's involved, glutamate is involved. And because glutamate is involved, alpha-ketoglutarate is involved. Okay? Okay. Now we'll see some more things coming up with glutamine and glutamate in just a little bit. All right? Here shows you the synthesis of these molecules. This figure shows what I just told you in words. There's alpha-ketoglutarate. If I put an amine onto alpha-ketoglutarate, I get glutamate. Notice what I've done. I've converted this double-bonded oxygen into an amine. That's what I've done. If I take glutamate and I add an amine to it, I convert it into glutamine. What have I done? Well, I've taken one of those double bonded oxygens down here and I have put an amine group onto the end of it. All right? So this is the two amines, this is one amine, and this is no amines. Okay. Now, when we talk about and think about amino acid metabolism, um, it's actually a fairly complicated topic. I've talked to a couple of you in here who said, oh, you know, amino acid metabolism, I want to learn more about that. And I don't want to disappoint you too much, but it's a, an involved enough topic that it will take more than we're going to cover in two lectures. Okay? So I'm going to make this hopefully relatively simple for you while at the same time teaching you something about amino acid uh, metabolism. All right? Well, before I talk about these, I want to give a, a term that I'm sure virtually every nutrition major has ever heard, and probably many other people as well, and that is essential amino acids, okay? So essential amino acids are amino acids that must be in the diet. 
And depending upon how you count them, there are about 10. Okay? There are about 10. Adult needs are slightly different than children's needs, and so uh, 10 is a good number for us to settle on. Right? About 10 amino acids necessary for um, us to have in our diet. All right. Well, when we look at the synthesis of the amino acids, we can put them into several groups. All right. So I'm not going to ask you how to draw each group, but I do think you should know what the names of the groups are. Okay? I do think you should know what the names of the groups are because these tell us something about why these individual amino acids are important. You're going to find that some amino acids will appear in more than one group. All right. The first group we talk about is the glutamate family, and it's one I've already been talking about anyway because it's got alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, which is the central player in the scheme. Remember, we're getting alpha-ketoglutarate from the citric acid cycle. Glutamate goes to glutamine. Glutamate can also go to proline. Glutamate can also go to arginine. I'm not going to ask you to tell me which ones are in the glutamate family. But I do think you should know that there is a glutamate family. And I would certainly hope, based on what I told you, that you would know that alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, and glutamine would be in it, because I've already told you they're all related. Okay, I see people frowning. Is it because I'm expecting you to know too many things, or is it because I'm being unclear? That's the dilemma of the professor. You can never quite tell. Questions on that? Okay. It must have just been that they didn't want me to give too many things. All right. The next family, is, yeah. They're just two of the 20 amino acids. No, no particular significance. Yep. The aspartate family, um, you notice that we've got one acidic amino acid family. We've got another acidic amino acid family. We also have an aromatic family, as we'll see down here. And those are all things that we can relate to with respect to the um, um, overall amino acid structures. The aspartate family uh, looks like this. And it's very similar in some respects to the glutamate family. Okay? The glutamate family had a, a one molecule that had no amines. It had one molecule that had one amine, and it had one molecule that had two amines. That was alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, and glutamine. All right? In the aspartate family, we have exactly the same thing. Exaloacetate has no amines. If we put one amine onto it, we've got aspartic acid. If we put a second amine onto it, we've got asparagine. Okay? These are exactly paralleling what's happening with alpha-ketoglutarate, glutamate, and glutamine. The only difference, in fact, between those is that these guys have four carbons and glutamate has five carbons. That's the only difference between them. We also see in this family methionine. And synthesis of methionine is actually a bit uh, complicated. Threonine. And threonine can go off uh, and make other things as well. And lysine. Again, you don't need to know those but um, that's what belongs to the aspartate family. Serine is interesting. I'll show you serine's synthesis uh, in a little bit. But serine is actually made from the, the um, uh, glycolysis intermediate, 3-phosphoglycerate, which is also a, a Calvin cycle intermediate. That was the thing that was produced when ribulose bisphosphate gained the carbon dioxide and fell apart. That was 3-phosphoglycerate. 3-phosphoglycerate gains an amine to become serine, and through a few gyrations, serine beca can become either one of these. OK. The pyruvate family um, is uh, called that because these guys are all derived from pyruvate. To go from pyruvate to valine, or to go from pyruvate to leucine, is, fairly, is relatively complicated. It's not a one-step process. However, to go from pyruvate to alanine is very simple. We do a transamination. We convert a double-bonded oxygen 
into an amine, and we've got alanine. So for all of the amino acids that can be made by transamination, you should know that, what their ones are before it. So, so far I've talked about alpha ketoglutarate going to glutamate. I've talked about glutamate going to glutamine. I've talked about exaloacetate going to aspartic acid. And I've talked about aspartic acid going to asparagine. Okay. Now we see pyruvate going to alanine. Now, in each case, what we have are molecules, are, are amino acids that are very easily made from common intermediates inside of cells. They're readily made from common intermediates inside of cells. All right, the aromatic family is uh, actually made from some, and these are fairly complicated reactions. We're not going to talk about these at all, but they're fairly complicated reactions. But the precursors are these guys. There's PEP. We get PEP from glycolysis. And there's erythrose 4 phosphate. Does anybody remember where we get erythrose 4 phosphate? What's that? Yeah, you don't know, okay. All right, so we get erythrose 4 phosphate from the pentose phosphate pathway. All right, so if we're making these amino acids, these are where these come. Now, I'm showing you on here all of these as if we can make all of these. Human beings can't go through all these reactions. These are how these things are made in nature. Some organisms are making them. We're not going to distinguish which ones we make here and which ones uh, bacteria make. That's just kind of silly to go and do that. All right, so the uh, aromatic amino acids include phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and tyrosine can be made in two ways, as you can see here, okay? It's this reaction right here that's very important for people who have phenylketonuria. People who have phenylketonuria, they're the ones that, that, that have uh, difficulty with too much phenylalanine in their diet. If they drink NutraSweet in their uh, soft drinks, for example, they will um, have really poison themselves because they can't convert the phenylalanine into, into tyrosine. And as a consequence of that, phenylalanine gets made off into something else and it's really a problem, okay? So this is a problem, uh, again, for if you have that genetic uh, defect. Okay, um, the histidine family is relatively straightforward to know. It contains histidine. And since I'm not asking you, it, again, I'm not asking you for any of these families to be able to tell me which ones are in them, um, that's not a big consideration. All right, so those are the families of amino acids. And you can see that there's about five groups there, and they are um, the ways in which amino acids uh, can be made. As you can imagine, I said some of these pathways are complicated, so going through all the things necessary to make these would take a considerable amount of time, and that's why I'm not going to go through and do that. Ribose 5-phosphate is interesting, though, as a precursor to histidine because ribose 5-phosphate is part of ribonucleotides. All right. So um, you've seen some things like alpha-ketoglutarate here. You've seen things like exaloacetate. And so it tells us that there is a relationship to intermediates in the citric acid cycle. Oh, boy, you're going to love this, huh? There is a relationship between amino acids in the uh, intermediates in the citric acid cycle and the amino acids. Now you're sitting there going, damn, who was it said we wanted to see amino acid metabolism, right? Okay. Well, again, we're not going to memorize this chart, all right? Unless you want to. If you want to, I will not stop you, all right? So, what this shows on the left are the catabolic reactions. On the right, it shows the anabolic reactions, meaning that these amino acids can be broken down into intermediates in the citric acid cycle. These on the right side are intermediates that can be made into something else, starting with intermediates as the citric acid cycle. All right, so I'm just going to step you through it briefly. You can relax, and I'll tell you what's essential. All right, so relax. All right, we see that there are three intermediates 
that are important for the breakdown of amino acids. That is, different groups of amino acids can be broken down into these intermediates in the citric acid cycle quite readily. This is not a comprehensive list. For example, you don't see oxaloacetate there, and I've already told you you can convert aspartic acid into oxaloacetate. All right? So it's not a comprehensive list, but it's here to show you that many amino acids are broken down into intermediates in the citric acid cycle. I used a term to describe the relationship of the citric acid cycle to the rest of the metabolism going on in the cell. Does anybody remember what that term is? Anapleurotic. Okay. Anapleurotic means to fill up. And that's what's going on here. Is this is in this case the citric acid cycle is getting filled up. In this case over here the amino acids that are being made from it are being filled up. So anapleurotic means to be to fill up. All right. Look at acetyl CoA. All right. Acetyl CoA can of course uh, be metabolized in the citric acid cycle because that's how we make citric acid by combining it with oxaloacetate. We see that these guys can be converted into acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA can be made into these guys. These guys can be made into pyruvate, and pyruvate can also be made into acetyl CoA. So we see that acetyl CoA is really a very central intermediate in amino acid metabolism. Very central intermediate. How many amino acids do we see directly affected by uh, uh, acetyl CoA? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 directly affected by, by acetyl CoA. Okay? So if there's one thing you want to take from this, it's that acetyl CoA is a very important intermediate in amino acid metabolism, both for synthesis and for breakdown. Very important consideration. If we go over here to the anabolic reactions, we see, again, alpha-ketoglutarate, we see oxaloacetate playing prominent roles, and they can go to a variety of things. Now, I'm not asking you for individual amino acids, going to any of this stuff, except for places where we have transaminations. So let's look at the transaminations that are on here. Glutamate, glutamine, both of these related to alpha-ketoglutarate. Okay? Over here, exaloacetate, aspartic acid, asparagine. Aspartic acid and asparagine, related to exaloacetate. All right? Alanine, transamination, transamination of pyruvate gives alanine. Removal of the amine gives us pyruvate. Okay? Those are the amino acids that are related by transamination to each other, as you can see on the cycle here. Transaminations are very reversible. I'm going to show you how that happens in just a second. It's a good question. Yeah. Transaminations are very reversible reactions. Yes? So the serine families are not made uh, by transamination of common intermediates. No. Okay. So transamination can play a role in a variety of amino acid other reactions, but not as a, a result of transamination of common intermediates. Okay. Okay, well let's look at some of these um, individually, okay? Transamination, all right? Here's an example of transamination. The question about this being reversible is very relevant because that brings up this, this slide. Yes, sir? Uh, bah, bah, bah. Three phosphoglycerate to serine. I do not have to look at that. I think I may have said that earlier. I don't believe it's a transamination. I have to look at that. Um, I believe there's a couple steps in getting it to serine. So if I said that, I, I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Now, a transamination is not something where we do what I said earlier, where we simply take off an amine and replace it with an oxygen or vice versa. Well, in a sense, that is true. 
but we have to have a donor and an acceptor. Just like we had to have a donor and acceptor for the um, um, electrons, we also have to have donors and acceptors for the amine and the oxygens. So for every transamination that occurs, one molecule is going to donate an amine group, and the other molecule is going to accept it and replace it with an oxygen. Okay. So here, for example, is glutamate and alpha keto acid. This alpha keto acid could be, let's say, pyruvate. Okay. And the reason it says alpha keto acid and not a specific acid, a specific alpha keto acid, is because the enzymes that catalyze this don't care. All they care is that they have an alpha keto acid. This could be pyruvate. This could be um, uh, uh, exaloacetate. This could also be uh, another glutamate. So any of these would, would qualify as that. Okay? It could be alpha ketoglutarate. All right. So what's happening in this transamination is that this and this are going to swap. The amine and the oxygen are going to swap. When they do that, the glutamate minus the amine group is alpha ketoglutarate, and now we've made an alpha amino acid. If this was pyruvate on the left, we now have alanine on the right. So now you've seen how it is that we can make that alanine from pyruvate. The nitrogen doesn't come out of thin air. The nitrogen comes from another amino acid, all right? And it comes there via a transamination. Now, the enzymes that catalyze this um, are, I don't like this term, amino transferase. They're actually called transaminases. Transaminases. So transaminases catalyze that exchange. And they are not specific to any specific amino acids or any specific alpha keto acids. I could take this very same enzyme and, and put up here aspartic acid and do the same reaction. And instead of getting alpha ketoglutarate, I would get exaloacetate. But the same enzyme will catalyze it. Is that a question? No, I don't. I'm not sure I understand. You're saying, why not take this whole thing here and move it? Yeah. Well, yes and no. That involves breaking a carbon-carbon bond, and that's not a really easy thing to do. Okay? Um, if you recall, one of the things that I said was very unusual in the body was we talked about uh, the um, vitamin B12 that had cobalt. And I said that was an unusual coenzyme. That's there because a carbon-carbon bond is being broken to move a methyl. So those aren't routinely done. So it's actually easier to do the, chemically to do the transamination than it is to move, do a carbon-carbon bond. So, okay, so your, your question is a very good one. So it turns out that the enzymes that do this are really interesting enzymes. They, they use what's called a ping-pong mechanism. So the enzyme grabs one of these and gets converted into one form. And then when it goes over here, it's ready in that form to swap. It dumps it off and grabs this and gets converted back to the other form, which now makes it suitable for another one of these. And so it goes back and forth like a ping pong ball between the two in order to catalyze that, that process. OK? Very good question. Mustache time. It's going to be late in the day, I can tell. <laughs> OK. Here's another uh, uh, transamination reaction, OK? Glutamate, oxaloacetate, makes alpha ketoglutarate, make, and plus aspartate. OK. So um, the one other thing on this slide to take home message is the coenzyme, OK? Pyridoxal phosphate, which is a, um, a, a vitamin, is uh, a, a, an important coenzyme for this reaction. Whenever you see a transamination reaction going on, uh, pyridoxal phosphate will uh, almost always uh, be involved. And it facilitates this swap back and forth. Is it happening in the reaction below? 
Uh, yeah, so we're swapping these two here. It's not listed, but it, it, it's definitely a, a coenzyme. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's not shown there, but it, it would definitely be a coenzyme for that reaction. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. What else here? Synthesis of serine. Okay. I promised the synthesis of serine. We can see that it's not a direct transamination that's coming from a common intermediate. There's 3-phosphoglycerate, which has to be reduced, I'm sorry, which has to be oxidized first to make that alpha keto acid, and then uh, the transamination reaction occurs. So when I said earlier that was a transamination um, of 3-phosphoglycerate, that's not completely correct. Okay, so that's how we make serine. No, you're not going to memorize that. One of the things that we think about, and it also relates to his question back up here earlier about uh, moving <coughs> carbons and doing things like that, is that there's um, a series of reactions we have to be very concerned about that are called one carbon metabolism. One carbon metabolism. And one carbon metabolism turns out to be important both for amino acid metabolism and for nucleotide metabolism. Okay? It's important for both of those. And it involves the um, enzyme folic acid, or folate, as you more commonly will call it. Okay? Folic acid has a big honking um, structure. Okay? A big honking structure. Folic acid um, looks like this. All right? This is one form of it known as tetrahydrofolate, or THF. All right? And this, the importance of this molecule is, well, I'll first tell you the health importance, okay? Folate is in our diet because obviously we need to do these reactions, but it's particularly critical uh, during the process of fetal development. We've learned in recent years that mothers who are deficient in folic acid uh, during their pregnancy uh, frequently produce babies with severe defects of the neural tube. Severe defects. So having folic acid in their diet is absolutely essential. We've uh, been uh, supplementing folic acid now in um, other foods than we did for, for a while once we've, we've become aware of that. All right? As I said, folic acid um, and um, other one-carbon intermediates are very important for making amino acids and for making nucleotides. So it's not surprising they're going to be pretty critical for cells. And they're called one-carbon intermediates. They're called one-carbon um, um, uh, chemistry because what they're doing is they're donating one carbon to a molecule during a synthetic reaction. All right? Now, I'll say more about that when I talk about nucleotide metabolism on Friday, so I'm not going to say much about that today, but I do want to show you the molecule and uh, just have you keep in mind its importance in these metabolic processes. Okay? All right. Um, this guy right here, Paba, um, you probably know from something else. What do you know PABA from? Sunscreen, okay? So PABA is an element of sunscreen, and bacteria use PABA as a starting point to synthesize folates. They use it as, a, as an intermediate in synthesizing folates, okay? Folates are essential in our diet. We don't synthesize them. We have to have them in our diet. That's why they're a vitamin. We have to have them in our diet. Bacteria don't have that option. They have to make them themselves. And so, consequently, you can mess with folate metabolism, that is the synthesis of folates, and not have any effect on human cells because we don't synthesize it. So the sulfa drugs, of which an example is shown up here, resemble PABA, and inhibit the synthesis of folates. Okay? Sulfa, this is a sulfa drug. Sulfa drugs resemble PABA and inhibit the synthesis of folates. All right. What's that? What are sulfur drugs used for? So sulfur drugs are, are ways to kill bacteria. Yeah, ways to kill bacteria. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. 
I have two things. One is I have a song for you, and it's a beautiful day, and I thought it might be a good day for some extra credit. We don't have to, though. We don't, we don't have to. So here's what we will do, all right? Um, we'll do it as before. I will ask you to fill out your name and your ID number. And I want you to um, write me a joke. Oh, I know it's tough. I don't even require it to be funny, all right? Just write me a joke. If it's funny, then I like it, right? Meanwhile, I'm going to play a song for you that I think you may enjoy, all right? And I will get it started. Let's see. Okay. 